By what name are you known? There are some who call me... Tim? Welcome to another episode of Timmy Talks, the channel where we talk old school magic. And today we have an old school match for you between a white, blue, green ramp de uh, deck. And it is taking on a red and green Atok brew. And before we go to the matches, I'll do a little bit of deck tech. I don't have deck pictures, but I have a few cards, key cards that I'd like to discuss with you. If you'd like to go straight to the games, you can check out the timestamp in the description below. Click the timestamp and that will take you straight to the games. So here I am first going to discuss our ramp build. The player on the left is Gideon and he's playing with this deck, uh, white, blue, green, and I've called it a ramp deck. You could also call it a mid-range deck. The reason I've called it a ramp deck is because he's playing with Felwer Stones and Birds of Paradise and he has a lot of big creatures that he's trying to play early in the game to get some pressure on the board so to kind of get ahead on the game here. Interesting is to say he's not playing with an Armageddon, he's not playing with any Ice Storm, so he's trying to like do his own thing and, and really win through combat damage in this deck. He's also playing with blue power. So I think ideally for this deck is to have a Birds of Paradise turn one or a Felwer Stone turn two, and then quickly ramp out your big creatures, the Urn of Jinn, Surrender for Freaks and Sarah Angels, and kind of put full pressure on. He's also playing with the full uh, control package from white, so Swords of Plow Sears and Disenchants and the Balance. And co combine that with the blue power and very strong creatures, you've got a pretty good deck. So that's the first deck that's of the player on the left of Gideon, this white, blue and green ramp brood. Now let's take a look at the other deck. The player on the right is Frank and, or I should say Frank in Dutch. And he's playing with a red-green Atok deck, so that's quite interesting. So we see your standard Atok tricks with the very aggressive uh, artifacts that we see here on the right. So Copper Tablet, Black Vice, and Ankh of Mishra. And he's combining that with the color green. So he's playing with Berserks, of course. Atox, I believe he has Juggernauts in here as well. Giant Gross, maybe, I'm not 100% sure. Um, let's see, he's also playing with Sylvan Library, of course, to keep his hand filled up because that's one of the difficulties with aggressive decks they tend to kind of slow down when you run out of steam and you haven't won the game yet then it can get really problematic of course he's also playing with lightning bolts and chain lightning so with that direct damage in this brew so i think it's really going to be a handful for uh, for the opponent for the ramp deck we just uh, we just saw because this Atok deck can just go so incredibly quickly. On the other hand, the, the ramp deck is able to get out really big creatures. That also means blockers really early. Maybe empty the hand early so the vice won't be as effective. We'll just have to see, but it's definitely going to be interesting to see an Atok brew combined with the color green instead of the color blue or a mono Atok deck. So looking forward to this matchup. Let's go to game number one. Game number one, and we have uh, the ramp player, his name is Gideon, he's sitting on the left, so he's playing with the white, blue, and green deck, and the player with the orange sleeves playing on the Timmy playmat is Frank, and he's playing with the Atok deck. And like I said before, the ramp deck, oh, look at that, a lot of lands taking in Mulligan here. Um, like I said before, the ramp deck is not really a ramp deck. I just call it that way because he's playing with Birds and Felwer Stone. It's more of a mid-range brew with a lot of beef, beefy creatures in there. And there we see a good start from Frank with that Soul Ring. So that means he can accelerate. I believe he plays with Juggernaut, so maybe it's, it means a turn to Juggernaut here. If he's lucky and if... The ramp player is unlucky. Passing turn here, untapping. What is he going to do? Playing a Mishra's Factory, and there it is. There's the Juggernaut. So that means a lot of pain next turn, unless Gideon can find a Disenchant or some other type of removal. Of course, he is playing with that white control package. So he is playing with four swords, I believe, and four Disenchants. I'm not 100% certain, though. Sometimes they kind of play with three swords or three discs and then put them in their sideboard. So I'm not quite sure what the exact um, number of swords and disenchants are, but there is no swords or disenchant. Instead, there's a Felwer Stone, so a little bit of ramping, but that means a lot of damage now. Tapping for three mana, using two to play the Atok, one to animate the factory, tacking it for seven, and Gideon is in trouble already here. He's on 13, he'll need to do something. 
And this at least is something, it's an Urnum Gin. Probably gonna block that on the Juggernaut, trading that off. That's not a great trade to make, but it does mean he doesn't take five more damage. And I wonder now if Frank's gonna play out an artifact perhaps and attack with the Atok as well. It looks like he doesn't, just attacking here with the Juggernaut. And exactly that's what happens, they're trading it away. Blocking both dice, no tricks here from Frank, but also no land drop. So this is kind of problematic here, missing the land drop. And there's a strip mine taking away the factory. And of course that Black Lotus. Ooh, look at this. So with one single turn, Gideon has changed the situation. And he's now kind of taking the lead, having more land, having that IC, having that factory to possibly deal some damage. Is he going to tap down the soul ring now? I don't think he's doing it because that's of course a choice that you have to make. And there's an ank of Mishra. So that artifact that when you play a land, it deals two damage to the person that cast casted the land. Can you say that casted the land? Anyway, um, you know what I mean? And uh, we see Gideon just attacking with the factory, not playing out a land. Frank now on 16. He is playing out a land, so he's actually damaging himself here with his own Ankh of Mishra. And there's the tap of the Atok. So Gideon just wants to keep the way clear for his factory. And there we saw a fireball to the dome. So that means Gideon is now on 10. Another attack here, putting Frank on 14. So it's a pretty close game. I do feel that... Um, Gideon has the upper hand here with the Felwer Stone and the two birds and that Icy. But when you're playing against Atok, you're playing against a lot of burn. And that means that when you're on 10 already, it's kind of getting risky. There's a forest. Frank again taking damage from his own Ankh of Mishra, going to 10 here. And what is he going to do? First, he wants to declare attack. That means a tap here from the Atok. And there's a Hurricane. Interesting card to play. In this case, also a pretty good choice because it kills the birds, but it also deals four damage to Frank himself. That means he's on six. Gideon is on six. But all that Frank now needs is a little bit of direct damage to end Gideon. And direct damage is, of course, in the Atak brew, but now the Ram player can deal two more damage. And that factory is putting in so much work there on the left side of the table. And how is this going to end up? So we see Frank on four, Gideon on six. What's going to happen? Wants to attack again. Of course it gets stepped down. That IC is doing a lot of work. Look at that, a disintegrate. Is it enough? No, it's not. He's still on two life. And I think, I mean, Gideon needs to finish it by now. But it looks like he cannot. Two against two here. Frank needs to take the win. Tapping three, untapping it again. Wants to attack. There we see the tap. And there's a Wheel of Fortune. Oh, <laughs> all that Frank needs is a single Lightning Bolt or actually a Chain Lightning because it's his, his turn, second main phase. Oh, and look at that. He has an, an Swords of Plowsiers in hand that he wanted to keep because he can use his Swords to kill his own factory to gain some life. There's it. Oh, there's a lightning bolt and that's game. He didn't have enough mana to animate his factory and play his swords over it. So, wow, what a close, close, close game. So that means the first win here goes to Frank. Well, the first win of the game because this was game number one. So uh, let's give these players some time to sideboard and then we'll go to game number two. Game number two. And this time it's a player on the left on the play. So with the ramp deck, the uh, white blue and green ram deck taking on the green atok build so red green atok build that looks like a pretty good opening hand there with the swords to plow series and of course that ancestral recall so this is looking really good for gideon the player on the left let's see what can frank do here playing a mountain into a mana vault so again he has that one drop mana ramp First game he had a soul ring, this time he has a mana vault. Let's see, and there's a Mishra's factory. Nice birds of paradise here. 
with that mark pool signature. And there's a forest tapping here for a soul ring. A lot of ramping going on, paying everything. Oh, interesting. I like this. I must say I kind of like the hurricane. Uh, interesting they're not taking any damage from the hurricane, by the way. So it looks like they're... Oh, he's playing. Okay, my mistake. He's playing a hurricane for one, killing the birds, and also playing a Suchi. I personally, maybe I would have just gone all out with my hurricane, you know, because damage is so important. It does mean uh, after that quick sorts to plow series, it does mean that Frank is getting some uh, some life. Losing some life again, it seems, with that Mishra's factory attack and the damage from the mana vault. So he's back on 20. Here we see a nice, <laughs> this is a nice proxy of a Chaos Orb. And a will we see a flip? I mean, that's going to be interesting. He's not using it straight away. Usually, what I personally do when I play against white, uh, against a deck with white, uh, as soon as they see my player tapping out, like this situation, I'm going to use it. And that's a hit. So that means the Urnum Jin is gone. And he's untapping his own mana vault. Of course, I'm doing this because I don't want to run into a disenchant. And playing a mountain. And he's tapping for four here. Another Suchi. So a lot of pressure on the board by Frank. Another swords. Of course, we saw those swords in the opening hand of Gideon. And then I already kind of had the idea, okay, that's really great. And there is an attack here. So Frank's going on 20, attacking with that double factory. And you can kind of see how much work the Mishra's factories have done for Gideon in both games. They've dealt so much damage to Frank here. And it looks like Frank's kind of low on cards, only two cards in hand. And of course, Gideon played that Ancestral Recall early in the game, probably taking back the Recall now. Ooh, being able to cast Recall twice has a huge effect on the actual matchup. There we see the Lotus again, using the Lotus Bringing in a Serenip of Finally, we see a Lightning Bolt on a factory. That means only two damage at least. And of course, he's taken quite a lot of life because of the Swords to Plowsiers. So that means that Frank is now in 16, choosing not to untap the Mana Vault. Tapping four, five. Disintegrate here. Disintegrate for four. And there is a Library of Alexandria. Not sure how many cards Gideon has in hand. It looks like he only has two in hand, so it's not going to be very effective in this moment here. Attacking with the factory again. Untapping the Mana Vault here by Frank. The game's going pretty quickly. Playing a Sylvan Library. Maybe that can help him because he is in trouble now. He's going to take five more damage. And he is tapped out. So this is always nice when your opponent is tapped out. You don't have to worry about a Shatter, in this case a Crumble, or a Lightning Bolt. You can just attack with the Factory. Not sure why he's thinking about this. Maybe that last card in his hand is a Berserk or something. Okay, it's his second Surrender Pafrit. And I think this is going to be really difficult for Frank. And I think the, the difference in this game is made by the Double Ancestral Recall. Just having so much fuel in hand. And of course, having those sorts of plows here. But when you're able to play out a double ancestral recall in a game, it's going to be really difficult for your opponent to kind of, you know, get um, fight it because you simply have less cards, so you have less answers. Attacking here, second at Mana Vault to the Atok with that block on the factory. That means the factory is gone, but look at this. He's only on three life. It's almost impossible for him to survive this. He needs a balance, but he's not playing with white. And that's it. That's game. So that means it's 1-1 one, one here. And we have a decisive game number three. Game number three. Always exciting to see a third game. And I mean, this can go either way. I do feel the ATOC player has a slight advantage being on the play here and playing a very aggressive brew. And it would be nice to see a Berserk over an ATOC. But don't forget that the white, blue, and green deck is playing with a lot of big, beefy creatures. Is playing with that whole white control package. Uh, he's taking a mulligan here, by the way. We see a hand with two birds of paradise. 
a surrender a free there i think on the left oh there it is and he's actually putting that one away interesting choice maybe he wants to keep his mana ramp because he also has a jdm tome so he wants to be able to have enough mana to use the tome and of course he has that uh oh look at this changing his mind playing out a birds of paradise he has the demonic tutor that he can use to tutor for an ancestral recall for example to get some card draw going and there we see a second land drop and there's an atok hitting the board and playing a demonic tutor now and will he look up yeah he's going to look up the ancestral showing it straight away playing it out and i do believe i saw gideon drawing a yeah there it is a sword to plowsiers as well so that's an interesting target of uh, the atok is an interesting target of course for the swords and let's see playing out a second mountain but lands are not really an issue here and i think for frank what would be ideal now is just to play to basically use all his mana to put some more creatures on the board some more pressure attack with the atok and sack the vault to the atok but it looks like he's just going to attack for one here. And that's what he does. Attacking for one. That means Gideon is going to 19 here. He's also playing. Oh, look at that. Playing a bolt over the birds. And playing that chaos orb there. That proxy. It's now on the board. And there's another birds of paradise. Will we also see a soul ring now? There's a strip mine over the tundra, or the, sorry, the taiga. And he's not, interesting, he's not using it. So he's keeping a white mana open, or a blue mana, but I think a white mana in this case, possibly, there it is, there's the swords. And he's taking a life, we're going to 21. Oh, he's not, he's actually playing an avoid fate. Oh, and there we kind of see... Maybe a little mistake here from Gideon not playing that Swords earlier. Then again, you don't expect an Avoid Fate. Nice to see that card being useful. There we see a Soul Ring and then he plays the Surrender Afrit and also having a Factory now in the game. There is another Tiger, or a new Tiger I should say. Lance is not a problem here for the Atok player. And is he going to put the Atok sideways, put pressure on, or is he going to use the Chaos Orb perhaps? no he's attacking interesting choice and oh and in response to the sec there is another sword to plows here that means it's going to oh he is taking the life interesting because i think in response to the sec you can play the swords and then he doesn't get the life he just get gains one life let me know in the comments below if i'm wrong or if i'm correct because I'm wrong often, so I wouldn't be surprised if I'm wrong here. Tapping five mana for an Urnum and also animating the factory. And now he's going to use his Chaos Orb. This is not looking good for the Atok player. And that is a hit on the Urnum. I think he needs a city in a bottle here. Passing turn. And another five. Hit for five here. Will he use a lightning bolt on... Ooh, is he going to use a berserk here? Tapping one green. He is thinking about it. Obviously, it's not what you want to do, but you can use a berserk for removal. Is it also his last card in hand? He is using the berserk. That means he takes double damage, so that is a hefty price to pay here. So he's going to 10. Then we see that book. And that book can make a change in this game, because he's just going to keep drawing cards. Look at that, drawing a disenchant and a swords in hand as well. Using the book already, interesting. And finding another bird, playing it out directly. And there is a black vice that's not going to be very helpful at this moment in the game. Uh, it's going to six here. Sarah Angel playing a soul ring. Boom, and that's game. <laughs> oh, I mean, 
as soon as that ATOC was was dealt with, um, it was kind of played. The game was was pretty much uh, over from there, and you could see this difference here uh, with the ancestral recall finding enough cards to play. And that is, of course, a big difference. So, uh, congratulations to Gideon for winning this game with his white, blue, green, I guess you could say mid-range deck. I've called it a ramp deck here, but you could say mid-range as well. For now, thank you for watching this episode of Timmy Talks, the channel where we talk old school magic. And if you want to support the channel, you can do so by becoming a member, liking the video, leaving a comment, of course, that's another option. Please do so, that helps. And apparently you can also click a notification bell. So if you do that, you'll get an auto update whenever I update and put a new movie on my channel. So that would be really useful if you want to follow Timmy Talks. Another way to support the channel is by becoming a Patreon. So you can check it out, patreon.com slash Timmy Talks. Talking about Patreons, let's have a look at the end scroll. Ich kann das Fingertisch zum Bakasin.